All right. Well, um, I know everyone is completely brain dead, so I apologize for doing this at the end of the day. <laughs> um, but we're just going to quickly go over mission planning. And so we're going to talk about sort of an overview of it, some rules of thumb and some uh, challenging environments and solutions for that. And then also some tools and resources. And hopefully we'll get through that pretty quickly. And then we can just demo some mission planning apps for you guys. Um, a heads up, if you are doing drone deploy stuff tomorrow or on Wednesday, um, best thing to do is to set up a drone deploy uh, account online. So you go to dronedeploy.com, you can set up a trial account, and that way you can actually follow along and play with stuff then. Um, the presentation on Wednesday will be actually someone from the company. They're going to zoom in and join us and sort of show some use cases and maybe show tips and tricks as well. So that'll be great. Okay. So, um, so terminology that we're going to be talking about, um, most of the mission planning that we'll be doing is some form of autonomous flights. So you won't necessarily be in control of what the drone is doing at all times. Your thumbs will probably be off the controller and you'll just be watching it do its thing, which is always entertaining. Um, we will talk about mission planning and flight planning because those are potentially two different things and then go over some of the apps and flight management software, that kind of stuff. Okay. So we've said it before and we'll keep saying it again is drones are really cool. They're really fun. What do I actually need? <laughs> so what kind of drone imagery do you need? You've decided you do need a drone. Great. Uh, get your data, get your images. Do you need video? Do you need a 360? Um, do you want point photos around a particular location that you can go back to over time? Or do you need to do photogrammetry and create an orthomosaic and stitch your images together into a big super image? and get all the other things that go along with that. Um, if you choose the photogrammetry route, uh, awesome. And then this will create lots of outputs for you. So stitching all these individual images together will give you the author mosaic, the big mega stitched image. It will also potentially give you a vegetation indices, especially if you're using multispectral. Some processing platforms now will give you a pseudo uh, veg indices from the RGB. You can use point clouds, so that's the 3D structure in points, um, digital surface model, and a textured mesh where you take that 3D structure and it drapes the imagery over it so it becomes colored. Ooh, and the drone flies off. Great. Okay. Um, so, why do we do mission planning? Basically, uh, it's super simple and it's to get better data. Fundamentally, that's why we do it. Um, so it improves the outputs and it also allows you to do things repeatedly. So you can have the same mission plan and come back and fly it over and over and over. You can replicate them, which is great. Um, you can share it with colleagues. So you can hand it off to somebody else and be like, hey, I flew this last month. You guys need to do it this month. Um, <laughs> automated and fun. Yes, this is true. Um, so what do you have to think about when you're coming up with your mission plan and defining everything? So project goals, why are we doing this? What do we actually need to acquire? What are we trying to collect the data on? How big is the study area? That affects all sorts of things like batteries and how long it's going to take you, stuff like that. Required GSD, this is um, the resolution on the ground, uh, ground sample distance, right? Um, so what is the what is this distance you need between the pixels? So do you need one centimeter per pixel or do you need 10 centimeters per pixel? This affects how high the drone is and how long the flight will take to do. Um, ground cover type, is it trees, is it grass? What sensors are you using? What drone are you flying? Spatial accuracy needs and the calibration needs. Okay, so as I alluded to with the height of the drone issue, these are balancing acts, right? So if you have if you need a really, really fine resolution on your data and you need that half a centimeter resolution per pixel, you'll have to fly your drone lower. What that means is that you'll cover less area per flight. So you'll need to fly more flights potentially to cover your whole area. And so, you know, which, what do you need? Do you need to cover a large area at low resolution or a high area, sorry, small area at high resolution. So figuring out where you need to be on that balancing act is really important. What kind of sensor? Like, what kind of money do you have in your budget? Do you have to buy the sensor? <laughs> um, size, aircraft, repeatability. How long do you have available for field work? You know, so one of my colleagues is flying today for us, and we're like, okay, we have four flight bat, we have four flights worth of batteries, so eight batteries. 
we need to balance that with the ability of like how much can we cover we have this study area we need to cover and then sort of working that balancing act and refining it down to i think we can fly 25 minutes on a flight that means i can cover this much area in you know the what 180 minutes 200 minutes um what's going to happen with the wind and the weather so today john called me and he's like so that plan i was like yeah the plan didn't work because it's 104 degrees where he is in the central valley and instead of getting 28 minutes per battery flight uh we're getting he's getting 17 18 minutes and so he's actually going to get probably 50 to 70 percent of the flight area covered instead of 100 percent um, also to think about sun and shadows. So what time of day are you flying? Are there trees? Are, is there elevation or cliffs? And how does that affect your data, right? So if the sun is, if you're flying at solar noon, then the, the shadows are gonna be really small if you're on a flat surface. But if you're on a hill, you know, you are, you potentially could get shadows downhill even if it's solar noon because the bushes will shade underneath them. And if it's particularly steep, that can be an issue. And then also, once you have your data, what kind of resources do you have for processing the data? So depending on the platform you're using to process your data, which could be Azure Soft, Pix4D, Drone Deploy, Open Drone, like there's all sorts of different platforms you can use. They require different amounts of computer processing, or you can do it in the cloud. There's lots of different resources for that. And some are free, some cost money. Okay, so we've talked flights. What kind of flight types are there? So the one you'll have seen most is the grid, just doing the lawnmower, going out and around and flying the lines, um, which is great for fields and agriculture. Awesome. Uh, if you're looking at something that has 3D structure, either buildings or just a lot of topography, and you're really interested in getting accurate 3D structure, flying a double grid is a really good idea because then you're getting twice the coverage and you have different look angles for the structure. This will give you better overall coverage of whatever it is you're trying to look at. Um, and you can also do polygons, which is, you know, just like an irregularly shaped area. Um, I will say if you are doing a 3D survey and you want to get the full structure of an object, so you're actually trying to document a building or a tower, get the full structure of a tree, then you also have to think about surveying in three dimensions as well. And some drones will have this option built in now with their flight manage their flight planning software, and they actually will survey the, the uh, do a quick flight around the item and then plan the survey in three dimensions around it to actually collect that data. So you're not just taking pictures from one height and looking down on the object and then flying the other way and looking down on the object, you can actually fly around it and take images from the side. And that gives you, as you can imagine, a much better 3D resolution model of the 3D object. Okay. So yeah, you, <laughs> you can go around an object you can fly and look at it uh, freehand, and then you can also swap batteries out. So if your flight area is bigger than one flight or your survey area is bigger than one flight, you can break it up into multiple flights. Just be really clear about your naming convention on your data so that you know which ones are next to each other. Write everything down um, because I've often, and I think all of us have been like, oh yeah, this is super straightforward and simple, no problem whatsoever. You don't write it down and then you go home, you sleep, you have dinner, a beer, whatever. The next day you look at it or a week later and you're like, uh, what? Uh, did this go here, this go with that? Or like, especially if things go wrong, your plans change, write everything down. A notebook, super, super helpful. Okay, <laughs> yes, trees, trees are your friend. Trees are great. They often sneak up on you and surprise you on the top of a ridge where you didn't think there would be a tree and your drone stops flying. Um, <laughs> so if you can, key thing to do is to put a big buffer between where your drone is and the top of the tallest tree that you think may be there and often double the height of the trees. Um, sometimes I'll actually take like the Mavic or one of the other drones and I'll scout the, the flight area. So I'll go out and I'll actually like pull the drone up. So your view out of the camera is straight out, right? And you can adjust the gimbal, but make sure it's it's level and then move it up and down until the tree disappears behind the horizon. So you know that you're staring exactly at the top of the tree and then look at the elevation of the drone, right? So then you know how tall the tree is if add a big margin to that. Um, when you're in a large area and we'll have a picture in a minute that shows this, 
Um, best thing to do is go as far away from you as possible to start with. Start your survey there and then survey back towards yourself because that way, if you need to stretch your flight time a little bit, you can land with a lower percentage battery because you know the drone is right there, right? It's finished its survey and it can land straight down instead of having transit home. Um, yeah, if you're doing multiple flight blocks in the same area, make sure they overlap a little or they're right next to each other so that the data is continuous. And when you process it, you're not gonna get gaps in your, in your data. Um, when you have elevation, this is really important, launch from the highest point you can because then you aren't gonna hit things. It's really quite that simple. <laughs> um, it, there's also things about like how high you can fly and this kind of issues as well, but yeah. Being above your area is really is really key. Um, don't fly when it's not safe to. I mean, it seems like kind of a no-brainer thing to say, but it's important to remember, especially if you're like at the end of a field season, you're like, I just need to get this one last flight and the fog's rolling in or the wind is kicked up. Don't risk your drone. Don't, the data is not that important. You can come back and get it later um, or not. And you don't have to fill out paperwork and explain why you've lost your drone because that's not any fun at all. <laughs> um, yeah, and then challenging surface cover. So one of the things that we've had problems with, right, obviously water doesn't stitch very well, but what also doesn't stitch very well, it's a giant field of grass that is moving because it is windy. And if you don't have stationary markers, it's very hard for the software to stitch, you know, grass that's waving. So thinking about that as you're planning your survey can be really helpful. Okay, so overlap. When the software stitches your images together, basically what it's doing is it's uh, breaking it into pixels and trying to decide if these pixels match. And then it knows where the drone was that took those pixels and then stitches them all together. We'll go into the photogrammetry methods later. But what's really important is that you have a lot of overlap on these images, right? So if you have 0% overlap, you don't have any common pixels between those images, right? So it's not going to stitch because there's nothing to stitch. If you have 20% overlap, you only have a little bit, right? So it's not going to go really well. If you go 70, then each image is covered by 70% of the next one. So you get good coverage. You get much better results when you stitch them together. And this is something to consider, not just a long track where the drone is flying and taking a picture, right? but also side to side and making sure that your flight tracks are close enough that there's overlap from the previous track. A lot of the mission planning software takes care of this for you, but you can change these numbers of 70% overlap, forward, backwards, side to side. Okay, so like I said, grass is hard to stitch, crops can be hard as well, depending on what they are. So one of the, for agriculture, dense vegetation, difficult to stitch situations, having 85% frontal. So like you're almost taking the same picture over and over again, just not quite, and 80% on the sides as well, gives you a much better chance of getting good data. Um, so avoiding windy is also key because like I said, when things move, that doesn't help. And then the ground sampling distance, this really depends on the camera and the drone that you're using. It can be anywhere from one to 10 centimeters per pixel. It can be lower, it can also be higher. Um, it just really depends on what your data requirements are. Okay. Some other sort of tips and tricks. Um, Make sure that your uh, flight area, the mission area that you're flying is bigger than what you're actually interested in because on the edges of your area, when the images stitch together, you're gonna get bad data on the edges because it has half the number of images, right? Because it's the boundary ones. So 10% is a good number. Some of the mission planning softwares will actually put a buffer in. So you'll upload a ML and it'll say, you want five, you can change it in the advanced settings, like five meters, 10 meters, 20 meters beyond what you've uploaded. So this is something to keep in mind. So I've often put a buffer in and then fly and then come back. And I'm like, why is this so much bigger? Because the software also put a buffer in. So then it's buffered twice, <laughs> but you know, good data. Um, if you don't need the high resolution uh, imagery on the ground, you can fly higher which means you don't have to fly as much because the footprint of each image is therefore bigger. Um, depending on your location and the data you need, solar noon minimizes shadows directly under objects. So that can be really helpful as well. Um, and then, yeah, if you're flying at a low sun angle, think about the reflectance of where the sun is hitting things that might reflect. 
and fly your drone so that you're minimizing that reflectance. Um, if your drone is affected by wind, um, which they all are mostly, but some more so than others, think about how your drone is, if there's a pre prevailing wind direction, think about how it's flying uh, in res with respect to that. And parallel to the wind reduces the kicking of the, of the drone, right? So it's, it's fighting to stay in its place if it's being pushed this way. The drone will turn slightly to do that, which means that your photos are not quite where you think they are. So that's more of a problem with the fixed wings that I've noticed than the quadcopters. They seem to be a little bit more stable uh, dealing with the wind effects. Okay. So yeah, now you've planned your mission, probably. Um, and so make sure you pick a good spot to start from. Um, so again, the highest point on your survey is the best one to launch from. Um, you'll be able to see your drone better. You'll have better GPS reception. Um, and you can, yeah, have a better viewpoint, which is great. Uh, flat is good. Level is better. Those are not the same thing. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, knowing your drone and knowing what it needs to, to land is really important. Um, a lot of them now have uh, sensors that say, I don't think this is a good place to land. And it will literally hover like a foot or two off the ground and sometimes refuse to land because it, it thinks that grass waving is an obstacle or it can sense that the ground is not uh, level, even though it might be flat. And so you can convince it to land by just holding the control sticks down and tell it, no, actually it's fine. No, really it's fine. No, I promise you're gonna be okay. And then it, <laughs> it will come down. But if you can avoid having to do that by having a good safe place to land, that's better. Um, obviously obstacles are bad. Sun at your back is really important because <laughs> you obviously want to watch the drone as it's landing or it's taking off. And if the sun, if you're facing the sun, you can't see the drone because it's coming down through the sun and you blind yourself and then you can't see the tablet and it's just not a good thing. So if you can look away from the sun and make sure your landing spot is that, it'd be great. Um, especially if you are doing multiple flights in an area, minimizing the time between the flights is really, really key because light conditions change, right? So if you if you land and it was slightly hazy and then you take your sweet time and 20 minutes later you send up the drone again and suddenly it's all clear, those are two very different light con conditions. And so the RGB image will look different um, and it just, you'll get stripes or just different colored patches in your data. Um, with multispectral, that shouldn't be such an issue because it's calibrated, right? So you'll take the calibration panel picture beginning of the flight under the new light conditions, and then those will be effectively the same. That's the whole point of the calibration panel, which is great. Um, and also the landing pad is super helpful, not only in dusty conditions uh, because it prevents the kick up and gets dust on the sensors, but also some drones actually use, they'll take a, a short-term picture of the, the target underneath and they'll actually come over and you'll see them do this because they're looking for where they think they took off from. And so a high visibility target for them to be like, oh yeah, that's home, we're good. And then they'll come down and they'll be all sort of happy. I will admit I spend too much time with drones, so I strive them with personalities and intent, but that's okay. <laughs> okay, <laughs> this is also really important. Um, looking up before you launch your drone. It's hard to see for the people in the back, but that is a drone that used to look like this that is hanging in some electrical wires. Um, because they didn't look up and they just went whoosh, and it went straight into the cables and is stuck. So um, <laughs> yeah, take a look around, just use a little bit of common sense. Um, oh, it is this specific drone? Oh, good, it recovered, that's nice. <laughs> Do we wanna know how we got it down? <laughs> Excellent, fantastic, all right. Um, so not every accident is fatal. That's great. Um, <laughs> yeah, and also, you know, you, as with all things in life, like you come up with a plan and you know what you're going to do and you go to do it and you have to change things up. Like I always say a plan is a great place to start, right? But be careful when you're in the field, use your common sense, look around and be like, do I need to adjust this? Are the conditions different? Is there a surprise tree? This has happened way too many times. Um, <laughs> you know, just, just, Think about things before you actually do them and look for electrical cables. Um, knowing which way is north and how it relates to your flight plan is actually really helpful because if you look at your tablet, they're usually oriented north-south, like looking at a map. 
but how does that relate to what you're seeing in front of you? And so one of the things that's been really helpful, I don't think it was in the list of fun things up here, but um, is having a cheap compass. Just get a camping compass, throw it in your gear so that you can sit there and you can be like, where is North? Make sure that you know where that is so that when you look at your map, you know how that relates to what you're seeing around you. Also really helpful if you lose your drone, you know which way to go to try and look for it. Um, okay. Oh yeah, animals and insects don't set up over a fire ant nest, never a good idea. <laughs> Just be careful about that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, so if you have a large flight area, like I said, you can do it in multiple flights. Um, plan the battery swap locations. Uh, sometimes you want to change your, your um, takeoff location within that large flight area. So knowing where you're going to start, where you're going to go next, and move your way through that large flight block can be really helpful. Um, a lot of the flight software, if you define your large flight area, it will actually allow you to pause the flight, come back, swap batteries, and resume where you were, and then you can just keep going that way. Some of them don't. So thinking about your mission blocks uh, touching one another or overlapping slightly, if, you're, if your flight software doesn't do this for you, as you fill out your large flight area. Um, if you're using GCPs, put a bunch down because they help you mosaic. They help you locate where your data is in space and put it together. Um, I will say I love RTK. So if you have the budget to do that and you don't have to worry about GCPs, so, so much easier. Um, processing data collectively or separately really depends on your computer resources and your software. So if you can process on the cloud with whatever platform that you're using, process them all together. Doesn't matter. It's not going to tie up your computer for a week. It's tying up a server. Fabulous. If you're doing it on your personal computer and it sometimes won't process more than 500 images at a time. Okay. So then you have to process, process them separately and then put, put them into GIS or whatever platform you're using to look at your data as multiple flights. And that works too. Like, there's no wrong answer in terms of that. And um, this is true in processing as well as flying. If there is an issue or things are looking hinky, stop, pull it back. Say return to home or cancel the process. You can always restart. And it's better to do that than for something to happen to your drone or you know, to other people. If, it, if in doubt, bring it home. And then start it up again later. OK, so when you are having to manually define the large flight areas and the multi-flight areas. So the one on the left uh, <laughs> is where you have a large flight area and the flight blocks are overlapping by a flight line. This is ideal. So that way, when you are stitching them together, there's images in common that you can actually stitch them together. Or if you stitch them separately and then put those images together, there's an area of overlap of good data. Um, in the middle, that's OK. I mean, you'll get kind of shitty images and processing on the areas where there isn't the overlap around the edges. And so it's a little, not as good as if you had really good overlap. This will not do well because there's only two or four images in common, right? So just sort of trying to aim to be on that side of it is always really helpful. Yeah, hilly terrain is fun. Um, there's a lot of it in California, especially on the coast and halfway out in the middle of the state and also elsewhere. It's beautiful. The weather's usually pretty good. There's a nice breeze, You've got some trees, but there's very few flat areas. It's hard to get to because there's often, you know, very few roads through there. You can get strong winds. You can get random planes flying through. Um, so these are problems with hills, but we can get around them. Um, <laughs> that may actually be my drone. <laughs> It's a surprise tree, like I mentioned. Um, so what happened with this one was that I adjusted my flight area in the field without checking the elevation model underneath it. And it cleared the hill, but it didn't clear the tree that was on top of the hill. <laughs> so I think that was a rock on a string and a tug moment to get it out of the tree. Um, so yeah, use your topography maps, always mentally add tree height. Um, yeah, and use obstacle avoidance if you can, and trust the obstacle avoidance. That would be my other tip. Um, a different surprise tree, the drone stopped because it had obstacle avoidance. And then I was like, 
what's going on? It should be stopping. And I tried to move it forward and flew it into the tree, even though the drone had saved itself. So don't do that. <laughs> I should also say that um, the truism of the more you fly, the more accidents you have is completely true. I think last time I counted, I had probably 750 to 800 hours of flight time. So I have crashed quite a few drones. Um, Brandon will probably correct me, but I may have the record of reported crashes. Yeah, I, uh, I, I do things with conviction. Let's just say that. <laughs> OK, so when you have hills, you have topography, and this can change your data, right? So if you're thinking about resolution, the ground resolution that you get the DSD is assuming that you have a flat surface, right? Because it's distance from the drone. So if you have a hill, you're going to get different resolution as you go down into the valley than you will on the top of the hill, right? And if your uh, flight app is thinking that it needs to have so much overlap because it's based on the top of the hill, right? So it's a very short distance to the ground. When you get out and there's a big valley, you're not going to have that same level of overlap of the images, right? And so this can affect your data quality. There's different ways that we can cope with this problem. Uh, one, you can ignore it and just be like, it's fine. And that works. Just depends on what you need the data for. Um, the other one is that you can do multiple flights at a similar distance above ground level, right? Altitude above ground level, AGL. So as you move down, move down with the topography. So your drone flies a horizontal survey, and then you go down and flies another one and another one. And it's about the same distance above the ground on all of those flights, which will give you similar resolution. The other thing that you can do, and this depends on the flight app that you're using, is follow the terrain. And so the drones can say you, it has an elevation model in the flight planning, and you can be like, stay 80 meters above the ground. And it will do that. And it will do the whole survey like that. And that is fantastic, because then you have the same resolution across the whole thing. But not all flights are uh, not all flight planning softwares have this feature. Uh, I will leave this one for you guys to look at later. It's just sort of challenges on different ground cover, you know, reflectance, albedo, all these issues about how that may affect what um, what your data looks like, how it stitches, um, and then yeah, different textures, different ways of flying. So overlap, higher, lower slower double grids, these kind of things. Whenever you're concerned or you're like, I don't know if this is going to work, increase overlap and then potentially fly higher. It'll give you lower resolution, but you the images will stitch better, potentially. Okay. So GCPs. Um, so John mentioned these earlier. Um, you can you can make them, you can purchase them. Black and white is great because it has high contrast. You can see it really easily in the imagery. And you put them out, pin them in place. Otherwise, the wind can blow them or animals can move them. Get the location of the center of it with your GPS. So basically, that means that you define your flight area. You have to go out and basically survey it before you fly your drone. Um, and if, you have, if you're doing multiple flights in that same area, this may be worth maybe a time where putting permanent DCPs out is a really good idea. And that can be paint on the ground. That can be um, tiles that you can get at Home Depot, black and white ones, whatever you want that can actually just stay there. Uh, I mean, we've painted black and white squares on like cement water tanks that aren't going anywhere or other random stuff that's out there. Um, or if you know that this particular random item, like a water tank or a windmill, you can go and GPS that and use that as a, as a ground control point. Um, anything to sort of lock your data in place so you know where it is spatially. Um, I think there's uh, resources online about how many GCPs you need for a given area for it to stitch well. I personally don't remember because I haven't used one in a while, but you can Google it and find them and that'll give you some idea of how many you need to put out. Um, yeah. Thermal data. <laughs> Thermal data can be challenging. Um, a lot of times it's uh, hard to stitch because it doesn't have the resolution, right? So the, the pixel size is much bigger on the thermal camera, so you don't get as crisp an image. Um, with the Microsense Ultim, uh, it collects, it's six band multi-spec, so it does the five normal bands of a multi-spec, but then also does thermal. And so when you stitch it, 
uh, PIX4D uses the, um, the framework that it developed stitching the normal five bands and applies that framework to the thermal. Um, and so it's not using the thermal to stitch itself, it's using the five bands to stitch the thermal. And then the reason this looks crisp is that, um, I think on this one, it actually takes some of the features from the five band imagery and overlays it on the thermal to give it a little bit more crispness and a little bit more definition. Um, you do need to have significantly more overlap on it, again, because of the resolution issue. Um, yeah, small areas fly slowly, do the RGB as well to help give it that crisp uh, imageness and also the RGB in addition to it. Um, yeah, changes in temperature, uh, thermal isn't, I don't know anyone who's calibrating thermal images. Do you? No. Yeah. So internal calibration within the unit. Um, so you, you might approximately know what the temperature is. It's definitely hotter here, colder there. The absolute temperature is harder. Question? Uh, Statement. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. So Brandon just said for those online that you can use a bucket of ice for cold and a thermal, uh, a grill pan for hot. Um, and I would say yes for the images that that's in. <laughs> but if you're doing a larger area that you then need to have ice buckets and grill pans out all over your study area in the same way that you would have with your PCP. So that can be, it can be done. It can all be done. Okay. So this is gonna be um, just a brief overview of the apps that you can use. And then we're gonna try and demo the apps for you live, which is always a challenging thing to do. So apologies if that doesn't work. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, it's <laughs> it just uh, that with humidity, um, the, the moisture in the air acts as a like sort of a dampening on the thermal differences, right? So the higher the drone is away, like the air is thick, yeah, fly low, yeah. Um, but you have to balance that with everything else. So, yeah. So with thermal imagery, wind and humidity, wind too, temperatures can fluctuate really quick. You have no wind, it gets hotter. And then the next time the drone comes by, it's windy, it's cooled down and it really messes things up. Thermal imagery already, or thermal sensors are already not really, that accurate, even though say in Altum, it, it renders its output in centa Kelvin that you have to convert. It's converted within it, but that that might be two or three, two degrees Celsius off for any given point. And then it averages the images to get a median value. So it's like, it's it's not, it's close to accurate. <laughs> That's the best you can hope for. Um, okay, so yeah, we're going to be showing you drone deploy picks where you capture. Um, not calling all these. Emotion? Are we doing e that? Okay, yeah, so we're not doing tower, but we'll show you emotion drone deploy picks where you capture. Is that it? Yeah, that okay. okay. Um, maybe a three, few others. There's a bunch of different um, mission planning apps. Um, basically, every drone company will have one, and then there's a whole bunch of independent ones as well. Um, if you're using uh, an online data processing program. They probably have one. Um, yeah. And then, like I said, these are the more independent ones. Uh, okay. These are just important things to look for in terms of your mission planning apps. We've covered a lot of these and we will give you these slides so you can look at them, uh, refer to them later. I'm kind of brain dead. Um, it's important to get a good tablet, make sure that it has a nice processor and it's got a really bright screen so you can actually see it. Um, yeah, do, uh, yeah, I think that's it. And uh, then we're going to do the demos. Yeah, you sent? Okay. We'll just do these ones quick. These are just going to be quick demos. All right, so I'm going to show Pix4D Capture. This is the flight app for developed by Pix4D. It covers a lot of drones. It's, it's a rather old app. It's not 
as well, they haven't kept the development up as well as uh, some of the other competing apps, but it's it's a good one um, and we've used it a lot. Uh, they are, I think, I think they are coming up with a successor product, which might be explaining why they haven't kept it up to date quite as much. Uh, give me a second here. Um, so for these little demos, we're gonna try to take five minutes each. We just wanna kind of give you a little taste of what these like. If you would like to try some of these apps this week, uh, find one, you know, maybe for a drone that you actually are planning to work with, um, install it and then try to plan some missions. And if you need help, come to one of our tech sessions or tomorrow, you know, we'll spend a lot of time outside. Um, all right, so uh, I just kind of want to show you the, uh, the, I guess the, the logic of pixel recapture capture and kind of how that works. So just, a, I'll start with a couple slides. So it runs on Android and iOS, not all apps do. So that's one thing to be aware of. Uh, unfortunately, there are some apps that are only on for iOS. And like our group, we don't have uh, iPads uh, in general. So that's kind of a inconvenience. Pix4D Capture, um, it is free. So that's, many of these apps are free. Some of them are starting to require a license uh, to work with Pix4D Capture, you have to understand like a project is consisted of missions and a mission is essentially a flight. So a broader principle is learn the language of the app that you're planning to use. They, they organize things a little differently and they use different um, jargon sometimes. Uh, but with Pix4D Capture, um, mission is basically the same as a flight. Uh, this is the first screen that you'll probably get to. You get to select your drone. It does support a lot of drones, but some of the newer drones, maybe not. Um, I can't see everything clearly from this side, so um, forgive me, but there's a bunch of settings you can pick. Uh, this is where you get to start you know, designing a mission. And again, a mission is a flight. You can see the different types of missions that they provide. Uh, that makes it easy. Uh, this is when you, I won't show you like exactly like how to click, but when you're in a planning a flight, you'll see a screen like this. If you click the little cog wheel, you'll see the settings and you can see the types of things that you can change. The drone speed, overlap is a big one, right? So you're gonna hear a lot about overlap. 70% is pretty minimal. If you're in challenging terrain, might boost that all the way up to 90. I'd say between 80 and 90 is where we do the majority of our flights. Um, it kind of depends though. If it's flat ag and easy you know, uh, images to stitch, you could probably get away with less. Uh, the angle of the camera, normally we go straight down, but if you're trying to get a good 3D model, you might want to go off meter, right? So you can set that there, maybe make it 75 degrees. Um, and then to actually design your flight, uh, I think all of these apps, you do it with your finger, at least if you're using a tablet. There are some that are on um, PCs that you can use a mouse. You just have to learn how, what the buttons mean. Uh, there's a button there that will, um, like where you're currently standing, it'll zoom to that area, assuming you have internet. Uh, there's another button to start like a new blank flight um, in the middle of where you're at. Um, you can rotate with your finger the angle of the flight lines. That also determines where the start waypoint and the end waypoint is, right? And again, you, wanna, you want the drone to work its way back towards you. Uh, most apps allow you to do that. You can change the altitude. And one cool thing is when, as you change the altitude, it'll show you how much time it's going to take It'll also update the GSD or the input pixel size, right? So if you're aiming for one inch pixels, you can you know, play with the altitude and you'll see when you're, when you're getting there. If you know you need to fly at 400 feet because you cover a largest area, you can see what is the elevation that you're gonna get for that specific camera at that specific altitude. It'll do all those numbers for you. Uh, you can do either plain rectangles or like polygons. Uh, there's different ways that you can add nodes to delete nodes. Um, and then what have I, oh yeah, edit it. You can edit the nodes. And then with Pix4D Capture specifically, you can see all of these apps, they allow you to save your project. You may or may not be able to sync them on the cloud. You may or may not be able to share your mission plan with a colleague or even yourself. Uh, that can vary. Um, and then, oops, I'm going the wrong way. Right Oh yeah, so in another scene, you can add a KML of your study area, right? So that's a good feature to look for because a lot of times you're planning your, your mission maybe on your laptop using Google Earth or GIS program. 
Um, and then PIX4D Capture has, I won't go through all these things, but you can have multiple missions in a project and then you'll see them all listed there. Um, and when all is said and done, uh, you hit the start button and that's when the fun starts. You know, after that, it's pretty automated. It'll launch itself. You, you track its progress, need to be ready to take over control. But other than that, it's, it's, uh, it's a pretty pleasant experience. Um, yeah, it'll go through a pre-flight launch and, and so on and so forth. So looking at time, I, I could do a live demo, but I think what I'll do is I'll do it. If anyone's interested, come see me after this. No, come see me at the reception and I'll let you play with it if you want to play with it. Okay. x 4 d capture will not tell you like the elevation where you are. It doesn't have a, a, a surface model underneath it. So you need to know how to how high to fly the, the drone to avoid hitting things. Okay, so this is a drone deploy. I have I logged in already. Um, so sorry about that, but log in and then you create a new project and then you can search for a specific location up here in the search window. Um, this is where we'll be flying tomorrow. And then when you've got the light, right location, you can move your map around to make sure that your home area is exactly where you want it to be. And then you create project here. It guesses what the name should be from the location. And you can say, great, that works. Um, and then it gives you a bunch of choices. So uh, drone deploy, you can do mission planning on your phone or your tablet. You can also do it online. Easier to do on the computer because it's not a tiny screen. Um, and so, yeah, you can pick your type of um, survey. So manual, so you're flying manually. Um, a standard, which is the usual map that we've been talking about. Vertical models, corridors, all sorts of things. So we just choose a standard map. It puts this right on the place where you said the home was. It gives you a square to start with, and then you can start playing with it and adjusting it uh, much the same way as Pix40 Capture. You can add nodes, you can take them away. You can zoom in and adjust the fine scale things, um, which is great. Uh, and then there's all sorts of different things that you can adjust in it. Um, the flight altitude is here. So again, it gives you a resolution. So it's thinking, 1.4 centimeters for a 60 meter flight. Um, you can just go through and look at all the different hoodads. Um, it's automatically choosing 75, 70 for the, the settings. You can turn that off and manually adjust the overlap. You can also change the flight direction. So um, if you want this to be uh, sort of a north-south flight, um, oh, number lock, great. Uh, it should then, reorientate the lines, or if you're like, no, actually, I want that to be 90 degrees, it'll turn it around. And you can play with that number, right? So as you change the angle of your flight lines, the uh, time it's going to take to fly that shape, especially if it's in a regular shape, will change. So that's one way to try and maximize the amount you cover with a battery is change the orientation of the flight lines, right? That also has implications if there's topography. Um, so that's something else to think about when you're when you're planning them. Um, you can specify where the start point is, the camera angle. Um, yeah, all sorts of different options in terms of ways to um, to tweak and improve your data. Um, and we'll be going through this more um, tomorrow after no, Wednesday afternoon in the drone deploy session. Um, so for this particular type of drone, it thinks it's going to take eight minutes to fly two hectares. This is not bad, 138 images, one battery, great. Um, and then, yeah, you can go, I think that's the main one. If you need to get approval for the airspace, then it will help you do that, uh, which is great. Um, and you can also, as Andy said, for Pix4D, you can import a KML. So I will say that I 
before going to the mission planning apps, I always go to Google Earth first and define my flight area there because it has a much better interface, and for me anyway, of checking the elevation, right? So define your flight area, and then I just sit there and run the mouse over the area, and I'm like, okay, where are the high points? What's the maximum elevation? What's the lowest elevation? You can do transects across it to see that profile as well to double check it. Um, okay, so, uh, yeah. Um, Thank you for asking that. I can't actually remember because I usually don't use this to fly. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, where do you select the aircraft? Um, yeah. Yeah, that's that's the one thing that um, I need to clarify. So uh, if you are planning this on the tablet, do it with you can also do it with a drone turned on so that it automatically knows which drone you're using. If you're planning it online, um, I need to clarify where you select that on drone deploy, but I'll have that information later. Um, and then, yeah, once you're once you've done planning online, it'll save it. Open up the app with the same username uh, on the tablet or your phone, whatever you're using to fly, and then select it there. And basically, when you do that, um, the connect your drone button here in the bottom right will turn blue. So you connect your drone and then it'll say fly, you press fly and it takes off, it does its thing, it comes back, it lands. And that's super easy. And then there's a whole nother aspect of this of like uploading and processing your data, but we will talk about that later. So you? Okay. All right, I'm gonna, just to give you something different. So, well, just one, one thing I might add to that. The, DJI Pilot, which I was going to show you in a minute, but different time, we're going to skip that. We're going to cover these things tomorrow too, by the way. So we'll have a couple uh, autonomous flight stations where you'll get a chance to go through these, see how these work. So you don't know, you're not missing anything. The, uh, but once you learn how to use, say, Drone Deploy, DJI Pilot, PIX4D Capture, they look really similar. And you get the principles down and it's just the buttons are a little bit in different places. So it's not a big deal. There's some exceptions to that. Leachy. You have to do a lot of stuff beforehand. And so like, it's a more complex process. And site scan, which is my favorite, that is, is a little more complex. And it's actually pretty similar to what I'm going to show you here in a second. I'm going to switch to the laptop HDMI, turn on Zoom for emotion. Sorry again. Um, I love emotion. It's actually probably my favorite mission planning uh, app but it's specific to the EBX and SenseFly. Um, one of the things that's fantastic about it is that not only does it have the elevation models in it, but it also integrates um, weather into the mission planning because wind is such a, a factor for the fixed wings. And so if you are connected online, when you're doing your mission planning, you can actually see the forecast for the next week. It brings it right in there and you can, you can update it. And it takes care of the planning because of the wind direction and the wind strength um, of what it's expecting. So it's really, really powerful. So one of the things that I really like about eMotion is that it, I don't need this right now. The, I don't need to update it at this point. eMotion and sight scan allow you fly to terrain. So there's, it has terrain following, but beforehand you need to download those elevation models. So far, I haven't had it bite me where it seems like it actually is pretty accurate to the terrain, both in eMotion and sight scan. Site scan is the only fa train following autonomous that unless Leachy added it. I heard they did. I don't, I haven't used Leachy in years, but there's uh, but they didn't used to, but I heard they might have. But following terrain is great. I'm gonna just set up a really quick project and we'll be able to get out of here. I'm gonna create a mission with no special name. And it will probably find somewhere relatively close to where we're at based on the IP. Where are we? Oh, there we are, Seaside. Okay, Fort Ord. I'm just going to pick some random area here. Fort Ord uh, Military Reserve. You can see it slowly coming in with this, the, the imagery in the background. It actually will cache that and save it to your project along with the elevation model as you design it. You set it up in here, and then you download it. You, you upload it to the drone in the field. It's you, with this app, you work from your computer instead of from a tablet, which I actually prefer in a lot of ways. When you do something like eMotion, you'll have to start off. It kind of goes in a logical order. You have to set your working area. 
So Blake's working area, I'll put out down a spot and it'll give me a circle. That's to prevent it, it'll, if it, it won't go outside of that boundary. It'll turn back and come back if that's the case. Sometimes you have to expand that area to get larger. Sometimes you have to go up a little bit in elevation, especially if you're in hilly terrain where it needs to go over a mountain or something to that effect. So what the circle represents is actually a geofence. And so it's a geofence around the area and above the area as well to contain, control, sorry, contain the drone. Exactly, that's what I meant. So it won't go outside of that boundary no matter what. It'll just turn itself back so it's geofenced. Next, you're gonna set up a start point that where you're gonna take off and add a home for a linear landing. Say I wanna land there. This takes a little bit of forethought. So mission planning, this is key. This pie that we're looking at here is the approach angle. Here, we might have a onshore breeze, you need to land into the wind all the time with a drone, with a fixed wing. Technically, you can land with the wind, but you're going to come down hard and fast. It's not recommended at all. And you really, really don't want to land in a crosswind because it'll come down with one end hit and cartwheel. So you have to set your, your landing zone. Next, you're going to come in and set your, your add your mission. So I'm going to say horizontal mapping. There's, that's what you use the vast majority of the time. Click around a few spots and then right click. And then we have, you can see the little bit of a pattern there. Once the drone connects, that'll light up in purple. And, and it'll, it'll, the key thing with flying, once you have this set up, and you, again, it takes some forethought, putting the drone out, getting the, the position, and then launching it and having a good plan is all it takes. And then you're just, uh, hopefully you plan well to have it come back down in the right spot. The only other thing, and let's see, they changed the, uh, the icon looked a little bit, but having, having a mouse or being able to roll around and look at this from different angles is sometimes good. You can do this in sight scan too. They're very similar. You might notice across the right, the left side of the screen, Oops, where's my, uh, um, if I click on the mission block and expand it, it will report what my ground sample distance is, my resolution, and then it'll show the flight altitude. I can try to click up, but then that's above the legal limit of 120 meters. So I, I'll have to go down to get down. And then you see with the, the higher resolution, the elevation switches, which if you can see it online, it's over in the side panel there. And again, just launch, have a good plan. Sometimes I like to put the drone out precisely where it's gonna land, mark that in my map before I launch because it'll recognize with the connectivity of the computer to the drone, it'll know that exact positioning. And then I'll rely on that position for the, for the spot where I wanna to try to set down. The drone will come down, it'll try to flare out and land on that. But if there's hills and other things around it or trees, it sometimes will detect those and peel off and not want to land. So you got to, it's, uh, it takes a little bit of finesse. We'll, on Friday, we'll do a demo. And with that, I think that's enough for today on the heavier mental lifting. Let's uh, go to some nice rest and relaxation in the evening. And you will all receive an email tonight with some more information for downloading your, uh, the material for the, hands-on computer workshops. And we'll also send out an email based on people's, what they responded about their experience with flying drones to kind of separate people in the groups. And then with their, we'll, we might adjust that a little bit tomorrow. So we'll meet here in the lobby and we'll split out to the, the area out there. And then some, some of you will come in here.